Okay, then I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Hello, everybody. Do you ever feel a bit lucky? You know, like my fat cat, Pepe, which is probably the luckiest animal alive and wouldn't survive one day in the wild. Or like me, uh, that I've participated in the last Janoscon five years ago. I'm not sure I see some familiar faces as well. And, you know, you get to work on the same product and you get to work on the same thing that you love, uh, WebRTC or video conferencing and bringing people together. And, you know, you, you get acquired by a larger company that allows you to get there and fulfill your vision of, of a product. So we are lucky and also got some talent. And, and this is our story. This is the story of Nero, of how it got acquired by Kultura, and how did we grow, and how did we deliver our solution to the masses, and are there any lessons there, and so on. So, I'm very excited to be here. My name is Dennis Sikun. I've been working uh, on RTC for the last seven years, and for the last five years, I've been uh, leading the RTC team at Kaltua slash Neuro, and I love my guitars a lot, play a lot. And after a few years of working with RTC, I developed internal masochism and decided to set foot on a journey to become an Ironman as well. This is me after a finishing half Ironman. I want to complete the whole thing. And one thing that I'm really passionate about is solving complicated problems with simple solutions. And this is the driving force and what gives me the energy to do things at Kaltua and with RTC. And for those of you who don't know Kaltua, it's a market leader in everything that's related to video, both in the world of video content and broadcasting. So at Kaltua, we bring together millions of people under our wide infrastructures of video. Uh, this includes content management systems or webinars or virtual uh, events platform or live broadcasting and also VOD solutions for media and telecom companies. And <laughs> In March 2020, Kaltura was also the luckiest um, company in the world because it acquired an RTC company just before COVID. And this was very nice. And yeah, that company's name was Neuro. This is where I started from. And until 2020, we were a startup company developing the next generation of a virtual classroom uh, platform. Um, at that point in time, we had already a few major customers and we were on the verge of deploying our, our, our new RTC architecture to production. And we did some beta testing at that point. And then two major world events happened. One is COVID and one is us getting acquired. And uh, then Neuro became KME, Kaltua Meeting Experience. And it's a video conferencing platform based on WebRTC, works on the browser, on mobile, and uh, native app. And we give you a rich toolset for real-time engagement, okay, such as desktop sharing, breakout rooms, chat, quizzes, um, whiteboard, you name it. We support up to one th 100 uh, live participants in a kind of many-to-many -many, uh, call or a thousand participants in a webinar view where you have 10 participants uh, that everybody views. And we can reach an unlimited amount of uh, participants viewing a room if we are just broadcasting the room from uh, Kaltua's webcasting solutions. So we can reach, and we have reached hundreds of thousands of people in a single room. And KME, it's a major part of Kaltua's um, other products, right? We can combine them together in, in the content management systems, in the learning uh, suites, and in the event platform, and so on. And over the last five years, I know it's, uh, the y-axis is very unclear here because it's very hard to measure maturity and growth. And what, what do you measure? How many streams do you, you have? How, have you, how do you feel as a developer? So I just drew this line. And I hope that in this presentation, I can connect the dots. And even though it's invisible, I still want to connect them um, and to show you our journey and what kind of lessons have we learned during this time. So was it just luck or is there anything to learn here? So for that, we have to go back in time to 2020 and to the surprising times of COVID, right? Big shock. 
Um, I don't think that I have to tell anybody in this room what COVID did to video conferencing or WebRTC. I mean, anybody who could connect to peer connections, I guess, could have also uh, succeed in some capacity. And that was also what we felt. And, <coughs> and at that point, um, as I mentioned, we were just about to deploy our architecture uh, to production, to the masses. And the masses were <laughs> really massive for us. And the deployment as we wanted wasn't going as planned, right? It was, uh, when you deploy a new system to production, there are always things you don't anticipate. And we had all sorts of problems, right? And, but we had to stabilize in no time, right? Because competition is hard and you have to get there to survive. And we had all sorts of problems, starting with scale and stability and bugs and really the pressure of time. So we decided to take every possible sh shortcut just to get things done. This was our startup mentality. This is how we operated and we had to move really fast. Was it healthy? No. In the long term, we accumulated a lot of technical depth and it was very hard to move on from there. But still, um, we had to do it. Just get it done. This was our mentality. But in Kaltura, um, we learned a few things. And this is the big major change, the first out of many, that Kaltura brought to the table uh, when they were dealing with us, right? So it's metrics and observability. You have to have them. And we didn't have them as a startup, at least not in the uh, needed level. So we've developed two systems. Okay? One is for just support tickets, an extended system where we collect logs and RTC stats that we get from the peer connection just to try to understand What's happening? Why is a, is a client complaining about? And then that gave us the ability to investigate much better each incident. And the second part is a custom, a custom system that we've built just to get custom real-time metrics. Okay, just, you know, we, we didn't know at that time what we wanted, but um, so we wanted to keep it simple. So one of the things that we wanted was just a periodic sampling of each peer connection in the system every 30 seconds, get the stats from the peer connection, understand what's happening. And another uh, interesting key point is what happened to the peer connection when it closed, right? If it was even able to be set up. And when we combined those two systems, we got a lot of things, right? We got a big clear view of our system as a system, right? We can know specific metrics, how do they scale between each customer, and so on. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, because you can read all about the implementations and what we did in this blog post that I've written a, a year ago or so. So, have a, say, a few seconds to scan the thing. <coughs> and, well, after a year or so, we understood that our system was a bit naive. We, it was expensive and inefficient, and I had a few design flaws from day zero, and it couldn't stand really the scale that we wanted to bring it. And it also became hard to maintain, even though over that time we did add a few interesting features, such as dial-in calls with SIP or uh, custom network support for China and for Chinese users. If anyone is here has done it, you know it's a big pain just to get through the great firewall and definitely get RTC to work in normal latency there. Um, and, you know, <coughs> over time, our technical depth grew and it was very hard to maintain. And maybe let's see the system first. Let's see how it looked like. It was very simple. And this is the system that we brought from uh, Nero. Okay, so basically we have four components here. Um, the first two, our Cotern and Janus. So Cotern is our, was our turn server. It was, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. It's very stable. It gives us the ability to use turn. It's deployed globally for us in uh, every region that we need to give service in. And obviously we have many of those. And then we have Janus, which is a very stable component. And we loved using it. All, all over that time, it caused us the least problems, if I should say. And then we have two of our own custom components. One of them is uh, the, our client SDK, which is basically an NPM dependency, an internal one, which you can integrate into any application that you want in Kaltura, and you get access to WebRTC, and you can just add a call with a relatively simple API where you can participate in a room. Um, that SDK connects us 
to our backend. So our backend at that time was large room server, which was written with Spring Web Flux, Reactor Core, all that fun world. It's basically a big Java monolith. That's what, that's what it was. We deployed those as well uh, in a few regions. And you know the client would connect to it with a web socket, and that server would manage everything that you needed for the backend, for the real-time backend of, K of Neuro. Um, now, on every room server, you would have many rooms. And a room could be only on one server, OK? And the room server was also our communication layer with Janus. It was choosing to which Janus you're going to publish, from where are you going to view, and so on. And it will also do all the protocol and the SDP exchange and everything. OK. So this design has a few problems that we've already um, discussed. <laughs> so first of all, it's the monolithic design that a room can be on a single server, right? This has some capacity. I mean, this server has capacity and it can grow only to a certain point until its resources are overutilized and the server can't run anymore. And so the only way that we could grow was up by using larger servers. So that was a bit of a problem for us. Next, our media server's capacity. I mean, each Janus also has its capacity, right? And because we had many room servers working with many um, Janus servers, that was a problem. Those room servers were trying to basically manage the same resources. And that caused a lot of collisions and caused us to be in overcapacity. And our way around this was to actually reduce and underutilize the servers just so they could run and run about 50%, which is highly inefficient, but that was our way. Finally, um, we had geolocation problems, right? Because we, the room can be in many places, people can come from all over the world, but the room server was in one single location, so you would find yourself in kind of an absurd situation where maybe you are coming from Australia and you have a Janus very near to you, but to negotiate with it, you have to go all the way, let's say, to West Virginia or something, or somewhere in America, just to send the message, and then the messages are exchanged, and it's just an unoptimal experience, right? It takes a few seconds just to join a call. <coughs> and it, it was also very hard for us to distribute the streams in in, in an efficient way, right? If we wanted to put a few people from the same room on the same server, that became kind of difficult for us uh, just because of the previous problem that a lot of servers were managing the same, um, the same resources. Finally, something I have to mention is that choosing Reactor Core and Spring Web Flux was a classic case for us for choosing the wrong framework for the wrong task. Um, it's a very complex uh, framework and it has a lot, a lot, a lot of small gotchas or thousands of abilities to screw up your system and not understand why it's happening. Um, I, I even now, after six years of working with it, I still feel that like I don't have the expertise to work with it properly, and it's just not the right tool for this task of a WebSocket server. And something that is not, was not visible in that diagram is that we were using on-demand EC2 instances, so just regular AWS instances, uh, that we were raising them, okay? So we had to know how to work with the AWS API and how to start actually the service and do a bunch of just bash scripts just to get things going. And it was very difficult also to maintain, you know, adding all the monitoring and the observability and sending logs and everything. We had to reinvent the whole wheel for that. And over time, it also became a challenging task. So we decided we had to redesign our RTC architecture. There was no, no way around it. But we are lucky, because the guys at Kaltura have a lot of experience in delivering high scale and very complex systems. So we gathered all the big heads and we decided to, we started asking ourselves the big questions when it comes to designing a system and really drilling down into, into a problem, right? First of all, which small actions do we have in the system? Not only in the RTC world, but in the general, in our, in our backend. You know, 
the smaller your components are, it gives you much more flexibility and capabilities. Which new components did we need, specifically in the world of RTC, right? We have a few tasks to publish a stream, to know where it's at, to scale it. How do we solve all our pain points, right? Um, and how do we scale up all the, all the new services that we need, right? We don't want to scale up vertically, we want to scale horizontally because that's much easier to scale and much cheaper. So be ready. There are some big diagrams coming up. Not really, but they're a bit messy. So take a second to observe. Luckily, no important part is blacked out. <laughs> um, cool. So what you see here, it's a, sing a view of a single Kubernetes cluster that we use. We have multiple clusters. This is just one of them. Um, so we decided to use some well-known Kubernetes design patterns just so we can uh, manage our components, right? The first one, first one, sorry, is the sidecar pattern, okay? So the sidecar pattern is basically taking some kind of a component, okay, and adding an abstraction layer above it, right? Every, I mean, a lot of problems in software engineering can just be solved by doing that, okay? Adding another abstraction layer. But what it gives us is the capability to manage our RTC services, which are our core, and what is actually very important for us. Um, <coughs> so our sidecars give you access to all sorts of things, starting from monitoring and metric collections and so on. And um, yeah, so the turn uh, server sidecar is very simple. It's just for auto scaling and monitoring and so on. And the more interesting one is actually the sidecar that we put around Janus, a, a bit similar to Janode, but we actually started working it just a few months before uh, the guys at Miteco started, so it was kind of funny, but it did give us validation that the direction we were heading was correct. Um, so um, this, that sidecar also gives us the protection that we need for the Janus, right? It, allow, it knows exactly what's its status and it can actually save it when it comes to over committing or just you know sending too many requests so this way we are also protecting our valuable sfus just not from reaching over capacity next we have the rtc controller now this component answers the question of where do i view a stream or where do i publish right it's aware of all the streams in the cluster it knows exactly how to reach them with which sidecar do you need to communicate just to get them and it lists that cluster's uh, sort of singular source of truth for a specific room next we change the way that we communicate with everything here to http the previous implementation was over websocket now this change brought us to the place where we need some kind of a gateway something that would uh, we would be able to scale out and use, you know, load balancers above all the component. And this little component gives us a lot, a lot, a lot of small kind of hidden gems and capabilities. <laughs> uh, it's basically a reverse proxy that uh, knows how to communicate with each of the components. Um, we have our client side SDK, which did not change a lot. It gives you the access to the WebRTC API that you need on the client side there, which actually didn't change almost anything. And we also have two uh, management components. One is a custom auto scale controller that is mentioned here just because it's a custom solution that we've made for draining down servers, right? When you deploy something with Kubernetes, the hardest part is to drain something. You know, you don't want your uh, call to have sudden blinks because, oh, somebody disconnected because I'm draining servers. That's not acceptable in any user experience. Um, so that's a controller just to manage that. And finally, we have also a small Redis in each cluster for just internal in-memory caching and just storing things. And if we put this infrastructure on a multiple cluster view, so it's actually very, very easy to deploy, right? We just basically copy paste. So for an experienced DevOps guy, this is very easy just to deploy on almost any cloud service in any region, just copy paste. Now we use AWS because it's very convenient for us. And the two additional um, kind of nice things here that we add 
Um, it's also the internal network, of course, of AWS, which is quite good. And it allows us to communicate between the clusters uh, on the internal network, saving costs and being a bit more efficient than the public internet. And then also we use CloudFront. So that this gives us the ability to use a CDN and get the HTTP requests from the clients from a closer location, right? Instead of going to some server. That's where the Nginx proxy pass comes to be really handy. And what did we gain actually from this transition, right? What, what's the, I mean, what, what's in it for, for me if my CEO would ask that, right? So first of all, we see now the RTC in Kultua as a service. Okay, we're backend independent. We can run in every uh, location that we want and any application can communicate with us. Next, in terms of system design, our components are much smaller and they're much more flexible and extendable and testable, right? It's much easier to test a small component than to test a huge, huge, huge monolith where you need to instantiate a thousand classes just to test a specific thing. <coughs> also reached a much better resource utilization because of using the side, we are using the sidecar and controller. Um, each sidecar protects it and the controller knows how to respond to situations where the sidecar rejects its call. And Finally, something small, which is kind of a nice, um, ah, sorry, <laughs> there is another thing that it's just easier for us to um, add new call topologies because everything is extendable and we can add any kind of change we want uh, much easily. Uh, we can go get to larger rooms and I'll talk about that soon. Finally, a small thing that is uh, Kind of a nice thing by using a sidecar is that we're WIP and WAP ready in case we could do at any time want to use WebRTC for streaming. So that's also a nice uh, cherry on top when using this design. Now, I want to mention, uh, sorry, I want to mention a few additional notable features that we've de delivered over the last uh, years. Um, where every dot here on its own deserves a 30 minute talk, but I'll just mention them. So first one, it's very important that we've added simulcast with the client-based bandwidth estimation. This improved our video quality tremendously and reduced our network costs also in that same scale. And it's a killer feature, in my opinion. Um, virtual backgrounds and, and generally media processing. We, are, we use a media pipe, uh, which is a Google AI uh, model that runs on the browser and it gives us a whole world of capabilities. Um, next, we have our custom uh, Kubernetes autoscaling solution, which is very interesting and very cool. Um, our unit test and CI for RTC, where we use Playwright, uh, it's also an open, so open source managed by Microsoft. Now, the beauty of Playwright and the reason we chose it is because you can run your tests on real browsers, on, and there is a big variety of them, right? You can run it on Chrome, on Firefox, on Safari, I think. We don't run on Safari, but run on Chrome and Firefox. <laughs> um, Safari is pain. We prefer to give an iOS app. Um, but the beauty about Playwright is that it allows us to actually test our client-side SDK, um, which is something that's, that's very complicated for us. Um, finally, two fun features, which are not in production, but got us some nice hackathon wins and just proofs of concept. First one is just in the world of video processing with insertable streams, where we use the, our AI models for nudity detection and hand gestures, just fun. This got us last win, a uh, hackathon win. And another, another cool feature which we just experimented with um, just a few months ago, actually, is a real-time real speech uh, detection and translation, um, which also got us a nice hackathon win. And it's a cool feature. So what's next for us? Um, so as I said, because we're using this new infrastructure and we have the, the flexibility, we want to start using the audio bridge API in Janus and start um, using audio mixing to, to implement the last and active speakers kind of uh, solution. In theory, we believe that um, we can reach almost an unlimited room size with a few cheats on the, the client side. And we also want to add and improve our audio quality with noise cancellation and the uh, game control. So to conclude, I think that I feel very lucky to be able to work on such things and to present them to you. 
And I want to say thank you all for listening. And I want to thank my team at Kaltura and the Miteco team for having us here in Napoli. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dennis. It was really cool. Uh, so, do we have any questions for Dennis? Hi, Dennis. Hello. This is Alessandro from Itego. Hey. I have a question about uh, geolocation issues you were mentioning. Yes. Uh, so, um, I'm curious about the mechanism you're using to measure the round trip time uh, from the client to, to the server because uh, the TCP RTT may, might be different from the media RTT because, you know, when, uh, when it comes to ice, the media path might be different. Mm -hmm. So, how do you try to measure the the, the latency in order to minimize the media latency? Right, so first of all, we, um, we always prefer to put publishers in their closest uh, geographical location. And that, is, that can be simply determined by their IP address usually, that's what we use. Um, and for remote viewers, we don't have yet a strong solution for that. We believe that uh, we're still viewing from the source something that we want to add in the near future once we add the, the capability of uh, audio, audio mixing is to use RTP forwarding to the closest um, geolocation only of the video stream. And that way we can uh, reduce the, the RTP. I hope that answers the question. Hello, uh, very good talk, Real, a gorgeous diagram. Uh, I'm Damien from Evercast. Um, Question. So when you're horizontally scaling, you, you talked about a custom scaling metric. I yes. Guess that's the magic. Could you, to whatever uh, way you're willing to describe it, could you say what yeah. metrics you use to yes. tell yes. Kubernetes to auto? Um, so at the moment, our, we are using the video room plugin at, at uh, Janus. And we use a video stream and an audio stream on the, that same Janus. And we simply count streams, right? Um, and we have our own metrics of how many we can, Janus can store. We load tested it with all sorts of instance sizes. We also fixed on a specific uh, group in AWS of instances, right? Uh, they call it uh, family or generation, like C5, large C6, and so on. And so we know how many, how many streams we can have, and we simply uh, use that count. Um, to scale horizontally. And to scale out, it's actually quite easy. To scale in, it's much harder. Scaling in is the really difficult thing. Um, and we simply have our own internal uh, kind of mechanism of knowing at what time do we uh, need to scale out. Now, if we see that we have a lot of servers which are kind of uh, in low usage, we mark them as ready for to be uh, removed. And about the mechanism itself, we simply we, we use the the Kubernetes API, okay, of knowing what, in which state the pod is. We use, by the way, we use a single pod for a single SFU, if that matters. And then we just mark that pod uh, that it's not ready to give service, but it still gives you the service. And then once it's uh, not ready, we just allow Kubernetes to kill it, basically. It's the really short answer. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, thanks for your presentation, mate. I, I think you mentioned that you switched away from WebSockets for your signaling for HTTP. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate? Actually, it's on... um, thank you, first of all, for mentioning it. It's something that I forgot to say. At Kaltuba, we have a standard mechanism for uh, sending real-time messages, right? If you want to send, like in a kind of a pub subway, okay, you want to send a message that somebody muted and just for the icon to change, so, you know, you need to send a message. Um, and our choice was to do the signaling over HTTP just because we can use the power of uh, CloudFront and the CDN just to get just a tiny bit closer to the client and uh, do that. And also by using HTTP, it's much, for us, it was much simpler to test. Did you observe any uh, latency implications due to maybe doing, uh, needing to do more requests to accomplish the same thing? No, not in your experience. No. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, great presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, using Kubernetes and 
Are you hosting uh, Janice on the Kubernetes? And do you have some kind of, um, like what are you using for an ingress controller? Are you using Nginx or something custom? Just because I thought that uh, the, the standard Kubernetes controllers only handle uh, TCP, not UDP. Can you talk a, mo a bit more about that? Yes. Um, so we use, um, so our, uh, our servers, our pods, I should say, uh, as I said, we use a single uh, pod for every SFU and we use the host network of that pod for everything. And that simplifies everything. So the RT, uh, RTC things and all the protocols, they, they, they don't live in the regular uh, HTTP world and the regular networking of Kubernetes. We simply open all the UDP ports that we use to the world and that's okay, as simple thank you. as that. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, I'm Michal from Software Mention, and I have a question regarding uh, client side bandwidth estimation. Yes. Uh, could you tell something more about this? Uh, for example, uh. which algorithm do you use, or uh, do you notice any problems with performance on the client side? And how much time do you need to, for example, probe the connection? Uh, yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, so about our client side bandwidth estimation, it's um, it's a big talk. <laughs> it's can, it can't be. Um, we can talk about it later if you want. Um, but generally, simulcast is kind of like out. Okay, you can never have a precise um, formula for everything. You have to always experiment, and we have in our internal implementation, we have all, all sorts of flags and uh, settings that we play around with sometimes and experiment to reach a better. Um, a better setting, um, but so every also every client on our, that that uh, uses our platform has a different um, outgoing setting, right? For because just because of network costs, um, and so obviously for larger clients we give them much better quality. But uh, let's say in the general ballpark is around one megabyte per second for upload, and for download again uh, for outgoing uh, it depends on which layer you're viewing but the highest layer is obviously one megabyte and uh, the lower ones are much lower we're using about uh, 300k and 200k for the lowest one sure any other questions or okay thanks so we had a great discussion of this i would really happy to see that thanks again